Hey folks, it's Patriot Nurse. And in today's segment, what I want to do is discuss with you a few things, namely the emergence of alcohol-based hand sanitizer resistant enterococci bacteria. Boy, that was a mouthful. Let's break this down and talk about it. This is a very problematic development in microbiology, but it's also, um, I'm troubled by it. I'm troubled by it for a lot of different reasons. The first is that I know where this came from, and this came from the emergence of the antibiotic era a few years back. But more pressing of the issue is what are the, the implications for us here and now? Let me break this down and kind of take away the scientific terms. So basically what has happened over the past week, there is an article that emerged and that essentially showed that these really nasty superbug bacteria, they're called VRE, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, um, they cause a lot of chronic inflammatory and trouble problems in people's bowels. Usually it's hospital acquired, okay? But what's happened is that because we've used alcohol-based hand sanitizers here, there, and everywhere, now these already resistant superbugs are resistant to the alcohol-based hand sanitizers, okay? And um, this is troubling because it's just another example of how we keep thinking that we're going to outsprint these bacteria and it's not going to work, okay? Um, the bacteria that we have lived with as humans throughout the past thousands of years, we have we were much more in close proximity with them. Okay, granted, not you know like every relationship you have good and bad parts of it clearly, but um, human beings used to be a lot closer to the bacteria that were in their environment. And really, over the past three generations, we have seen steadily a move at an institutional level to clean up and sterilize and sanitize and safify our environment. Now you like that verb, safifies. Um, but the bottom line is the world is not a safe and sterile place, right? It's not. And no amount of helicopter institutionalizing, helicopter parenting, you can't make the place safe and sterile. And so what's happened is over the past three generations, we tried to kill off every little bacteria, you know, with these countertops that were impregnated against bacteria and antibacterial soaps. I remember Safeguard when I was growing up. Safeguard, the ones you love. It's like this, this soap that kills everything. It kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria on your skin. Well, yeah, that includes the good and the bad stuff. And so what ends up happening is that we have over three generations of people in the antibiotic era that are living longer, but they're living sicker longer. They're fatter, they're weaker, dealing with much more chronic disease, chronic inflammation. And it all coincides, of course, with the, the emergence of widely available antibiotics. Now, granted, that's not the only thing that happened since then. I can make a treatise on this. But the problem is that we have killed off so many good bacteria that now the bad bacteria are essentially... It's like gun disarmament, basically. It's like you take away guns from law-abiding people and then only the bad guys have guns. That's exactly what's happened in the microbial realm. We have disarmed and killed off the good bacteria and so there's nobody to stand up against the bad bacteria. So what can we do about this? Um, let me back up and... and make a statement here. I go into depth on this in my Patreon newsletter this month. For $5 a month, you have access to that. So I'll put a link in the description box below if you're interested in reading more about it. But the points that I want to make here start out really with the average birth process of the American citizen. Uh, births in the United States up until about the 1900s, 1920s, were pretty much at home. And a baby's first colonization with bacteria was from his mother, his mother's vaginal canal, the skin, um, the house, the environment surrounding it, the baby was first colonized with the bacteria from his family. Enter the 1930s, 40s, and 50s with institutionalized birth processes and the shaming of midwives and all this other stuff. We start encouraging people to come to hospitals, read places where sick people congregate to have their babies. Even when the mother was a low-risk mother and there was no clinical indicators for transferring a mother from a low-risk place to a higher-risk you know, uh, modality of care. So what ends up happening is that from the time that a child is born, he is born in an environment completely devoid of the healthy bacteria for the most part that he would otherwise be exposed to. Furthermore, the, the early um, confrontation of this child with malevolent bacteria as what you would find in a hospital. When you compound that with a lack of breastfeeding, I'm not saying this to shame anybody, but I'm just doing this as a recap here from a medical standpoint. When you compound that bacterial disruption, with some of these more invasive things like deep suctioning of infants um, and then also cow's milk based formula, you have a kid set up for failure here from the time that he 
makes us entry into the world from a bacterial standpoint. Now, fast forward to where we're at. We have all these people for the past three generations who have not had the benefit that their ancestors would have had of having good bacteria in their lives. Um, good bacteria in their food, good bacteria in their skin, good bacteria from the time that they were born into this world. They haven't had the benefit of that. And so what we've done is by institutionalizing safe spaces and killing off all sorts of bacteria and essentially weaponizing the bad forms of bacteria, we've set people up for failure because now with these three generations of people that don't have good bacteria, they're just defenseless against it for the most part, which is why we're seeing things like chronic disease, chronic inflammatory disease, type 2 diabetes. All of these have very definite correlations with disruptions in gut flora. And so what I want to do is kind of show you some of the things that you can do to address this here real quick. Now, what I'm going to do here is to kind of show you what I've done here around, around the house. The first thing here is the easy button for people who don't want to work. And this is Green Vibrance. Okay, Green Vibrance right here is your, you know, full spectrum probiotic. And also it has a whole bunch of, of you know, trace minerals, macronutrients, things like that back there. I'll put a link to this in the description box below. This is probably the fastest way to get a hold of decent bacteria. It tastes like, in the words of one of my students, swamp water. It tastes like swamp water water that came from a swamp or like you took the bag of lawn trimmings from your lawnmower and put it in a blender that's what it tastes like but you know you can always cut it with some juice and stuff make it a little bit more palatable it does work and it gives you good bacteria now over here let me set this thing down y'all just bear with me for a minute all right this what you're seeing right here is kefir this is probably the easiest as far as cultures live and active cultures to do yourself i'll put a link to a good starter in the description box below but what this is is a live fermented milk product it's much more diverse from a from a from a bacteria standpoint than what you would find in store-bought yogurt uh, but this is very very easy and you can flavor it with different things um, there's lots of info about this video i'll give you a link to my starter now this year we had a bumper crop of zucchini like in the South, when is there never a bumper crop of zucchini? Ever not a bumper crop of zucchini. What I did was I just shredded this up with a food processor and made zucchini sauerkraut. And all you do, this is super easy, okay? You just shred it up, put you about an inch layer down there, and sprinkle some salt. Now, I think the salt is important to note here. I use gray Celtic sea salt. Um, that's what I would go with. And I'll put a link also to that. But you put about an inch worth of the shredded zucchini or whatever vegetable product, honestly, that you want to use. And then salt. Then another layer. And then salt. And then another layer of salt. End with salt in about an inch and a half of headspace. And that's your lacto-fermented um, zucchini stuff here. I also, right here, I'm doing zucchini pickles, which is in a brine. There's another thing that you can do store-bought-wise. This is store-bought kimchi. And uh, it is definitely, my mom says it smells like farts in a jar, which is really funny to me. But she doesn't like it when I come and visit her and I eat it. She's like, eat that in some other room. I'm like, but mom, don't you understand? I'm living healthily. She doesn't care. <laughs> she doesn't care. It's good though. It's really good for you in your guts. You should try it. Now this, I'm very, very proud of. Because again, we had a bumper crop of cucumbers this year and in this bumper crop of cucumbers I decided I had to use them before they went bad so I got this huge two gallon crop from Wally World I waited until after the first of the month for obvious reasons but um, what I did was I made a brine and the brine has a little bit of raw apple cider vinegar in there with some salt and then just various spices and then I put it together all together, and then you ferment it out for between anywhere between three days to two weeks. I like it right at the one week point. That's where I like it. And then you just jar them up and keep them in the fridge for a few months. Not a problem. Now, this is something for those of you who are familiar with kombucha, you may be pretty, pretty excited about. Um, this guy right here has been my buddy. It's about a hundred bucks, and I'll put a link to it. But this is awesome. It, it really produces superior batches because it keeps it allows you to you know, dial down and dial up your temperatures. I like it right at the sweet spot for 80. Um, but this ensures that your kombucha is a good brew. And I'm going to violate the number one tenet, never show, never expose your kombucha. Kombucha is fermented tea, okay? And it's rich in a whole bunch of different good bacteria. I've got my new little growth up here. This thing is called a SCOBY, okay? And this SCOBY, hopefully you can see it. Um, this SCOBY is a mixture of symbiotic, here we go, symbiotic bacteria and yeast and all that other stuff, but it's essentially a bread starter for your tea. And you just cook the tea for between a week to three weeks, and then you can bottle it, and you can do a secondary fermentation where you put fruit and stuff in it. There's a lot of good things you can do. 
I'm going to cover it back up so it doesn't feel ashamed and naked. Good job, kombucha. But yeah, um, those are some of the things that I do that I just want to share with you guys real quick. Yeah, I hope it was helpful for you today. I hope you enjoy looking at the kitchen and the stuff that I made. The bacteria thing is a big deal, y'all. And it's not going to go away. It's not going to get any better. If you are not already subscribed on Patreon, I encourage you to do that um, because the newsletter goes into this you know, more in depth. But we should be paying attention to this for sure. I hope you enjoyed the video today. If you did, please subscribe to me here on YouTube. You can also support me on Patreon and follow me there. I also teach classes, guys, on medical preparedness. This is part of it, you know, like being able to talk about the things that are going to keep us healthy. Because I don't like reacting to things. I like being the one setting the tempo for, for where I'm going. I want to be the one making sure that my people are taken care of and that they're eating well and that they've got good bugs in their body to help them withstand the bad times. Hope it was helpful for y'all. Hope you have a great weekend. For now, it's Patriot Nurse signing off. I'll see y'all later. Bye.